Hello and welcome back to Premier Injuries once again. We are talking about FPL attack for game week 36. And just to remember that game week 36 is a blank game week for Arsenal, Chelsea, Leicester City and Manchester United. So before you do any sorts of transfers, before you get in Mason Greenwood, because I know that you're all going to be liking and wanting him in your teams, remember that he's blanking this game week. So maybe hold off there. But yes, before we start, Ben, uh, are you excited for blank game week 36? Because your team is actually kind of stacked and well set up for this, isn't it? Looking quite good. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that you seem to be pulling away this game week. I need a big performance from Marcus Rashford uh, in the last game of their, their triple game week against Liverpool. I need to be staying on your coattails you know, pushing through to that final week. That's all my goal is between now and the end of the campaign is uh I'm just going for bragging rights, Jace. I look I can't I can't hide it. It's got to, it's got to be bragging rights. I think the interesting thing we'll see tonight with Liverpool and Manchester United, uh I think it'll be a naught naught draw. I don't think there'll be many goals in it. I think it's gonna be a cagey one. Liverpool won't want to lose because they'll want to go for the European spots and Man United will you know, they're trying to protect themselves with this situation. But you never know. I mean, with the way that the league is going at the moment, I'll probably be proved wrong. And, and I'll get a few messages on Twitter of people going, ha ha, like uh, Nelson from The Simpsons. But we got to go into the attacking um, assets. Now, we started off last video talking about the six best fixtures uh, for p teams going towards the end of the season. Leeds and Liverpool were the main ones that we looked at then. Uh, but because this is attack, I think it opens out the discussions a little bit more because we talked about Leeds-Liverpool. Sheffield United, I think, we're writing off in terms of defence and attack. But West Ham, maybe Crystal Palace and maybe even Newcastle have some assets that we should be considering. Just off the bat there, Ben, uh, what do you feel about maybe including those teams that I've mentioned there on top of the Leeds and Liverpool that we're very keen on? Newcastle would be a worry. Obviously, we've lost Callum Wilson now for the remainder of the season. The expectation is that Steve Bruce will bring in um, Geordie Joe Linton. And yeah, he'd done okay. I know the underlying stats weren't too bad. Got himself a couple of goals. Scratch beneath the surface and those goals. I mean, one in particular, I think it was a it was a bad mistake and it was a tap in from a from a couple of yards. So I'm not totally sold on that. But you know, maybe Joe Willock may you know garner a little bit of attention. Done well from the bench and then recent week, game weeks and then scored uh, down at the King Power. Looked really sharp. So he's been past fit. It was just a touch of cramp there. Um, look, I think it's going to be a little bit of a lottery. We looked at the data. We're hopeful that you know those uh, stats and statistics that we pulled, um, you know, post international break all come to fruition. Where we see you know more goals in games, defensive clean sheets are harder to come by. And you know, like I say, with the exception of maybe one or two teams, the Sheffield Uniteds of this world, that really opens it up. Um, you know, for the possibility to pick up a couple of cheap differentials, a couple of good enablers in there across the board because. You know, there's going to be a lot of chopping and changing. You know, Liverpool, uh, at the time of recording, which is Thursday, Liverpool are expected to have 10 players out against uh, Manchester United. Manchester United made 10 changes um, for their game earlier in the week. Uh, and there was a couple of names on that list that, in all honesty, I'd never even heard of. Nuno looks as if he's um, looking to blood a few youngsters and certainly give them some experience. And, you know, that's a, a sort of blueprint that I would expect other managers to adopt now that, that teams are safe and, in theory, don't really have a lot to play for. Do you think that those who are involved in the Euros as well may ask their manager to rest them a little bit more, may have a one eye and one foot in the kind of international camp? Um, in terms of fatigue and load management, no, I think we're, we're still looking at, a, is it mid-June? So we're still going to be a month away from that period. The only concern is, you know, if they would pick up an injury, i.e. somebody maybe like Harry Maguire. 
Now, you know, football is a contact sport. There are going to be injuries that, that will happen and, and will occur. You know, you still have to go out there and perform and commit as you would, uh, you know, and give 100% because otherwise, if you go in and, and dangle a leg and, um, and you're not, you know, fully committed to the game, that's when you're more likely to pick up knocks and niggles and potential setbacks. So, um, look, at the minute, I think players are just fully focused on getting their domestic campaign out of the way. And then, you know, once that's done, they can then shift their focus to, you know, those internationals and, and the Euro um, tournament. So we will shift attention onto those other teams that I mentioned there. I've got some an- analysis, some data to kind of back up maybe thoughts and feelings there. But the other thing that I thought was quite indicative is the kind of projected future points of these players towards the end of the season. Five best forwards and five best midfielders. We'll start off with the forwards, get your thoughts and feelings on them. So it's Kane, Bamford, Antonio, Calvert-Lewin and Wood at the moment. Any of those kind of stand out for you that you think you should bring into your team that you shouldn't? Maybe one or two of them are a trap? I mean, the form of, of, of Chris Wood is very hard to ignore. Um, he could be up there, you know, in my, in my team of the season, you know, and what he's done for, for Burnley this year, uh, particularly in the absence of, of Ashley Barnes. You know, he's really sort of took on that mantle and, and carried Burnley through so he deserves a little bit credit and respect and, and serious consideration and um, you know we've done the data show around Harry Kane controversial standpoint to some and and maybe uh, you know a risk but in terms of you know maybe getting Harry Kane out of your starting 11 and and maybe dropping him for those remaining fixtures uh, a culmination of his return from an ankle injury and, and maybe maybe not being able to hit the heights that we would ordinarily associate Harry Kane with. And secondly, you know, Tottenham just just aren't very good. Um, the reality is I just don't think they have the personnel. I don't, you know, I do like Ryan Mason, but I, I certainly, you know, he's a, he's an interim boss. He's, he's certainly not one for the future. So, um yeah, for me, Tottenham are a little bit of a void at the moment. So those are the two standouts from from the little list that you've thrown together there. I think one of the things that stands out for me almost is Bamford as well, because the news that you've discussed today is that Phillips is going to be back in that Leeds midfield. I think he's such a good facilitator, and that strengthens my belief in Bamford to kind of get... Uh, where he needs to be because uh, over the last few games he has looked a bit tired I'm not sure if that's just fatigue from this very trying season but Leeds at certain times have also lacked some of the impetus and and that creativity and and obviously against Tottenham they did a fantastic job so if they can push on from that towards the end of the season I think Bamford is looking good Antonio is an interesting one because uh, the Good fixtures are back, but the form is not with the Hammers at the moment. So that will be one to consider. And <clears throat> with Calvert-Lewin, I just, I don't know, I've, I've kind of gone off the Everton attack just because their limit seems to be like one goal a game. You know, they're, they're not very exciting. They're not one to watch. I mean, it's kind of like when you and I discussed Jamie Vardy, uh there's not a lot that I can look forward to when I turn on an Everton game. Whereas with some of these other attackers, you know, with the Canes, the Bamfords, Antonios, and, and even Chris Wood to more of an extent, I feel like something can and does happen over these last few game weeks. Let's move the attention, though, to the midfielders, the five best ones. Now, what I've done here is uh, kind of coupled teammates together so Salamane and Yota were the top three together and I thought that's a little bit boring in terms of discussing the five so I've done Salah, Mane, Yota and just to be noted that Salah has the most predicted points of any player towards the end of this season then Hyung Min Sun comes in in second if you will uh, Kevin De Bruyne along with Mares and Foden, Lingard, Bale and Rafina. So with that group of players there, does anything stand out? Are you a little bit shocked that maybe somebody like Son is so far up and maybe Lingard as well? 
Uh, I mean, Lingard's been fantastic since his arrival at, at West Ham uh, on loan in January. Uh, and I jumped on him early doors. I'm actually off Lingard now. I, I felt as if maybe he's, he's, he's run his race a little bit and, and possibly that's coincided with West Ham's slight wobble. But we know, you know, they've still got something to play for. So that's always a, a, a big incentive. And, you know, Lingard... Uh, the likelihood is he'll be making a move from Old Trafford. So whether that's, you know, uh, he remains at West Ham or there's other potential suitors out there. So he, you know, on a personal level, he still feels, you know, that he's got something off and something to deliver. He, he, you know, and he will still harbour hopes of going to the Euros as well. So he's one of those players that sort of come out of, of nowhere to, to thrust himself, you know, into Gareth Southgate's um, thinking. Uh you know the Liverpool boys. We've said for a few weeks now that we've always we've liked the running. And I know you touched at the head of the show about this. The, you may think that it's a nils each with with Liverpool and Man United. Well, Jurgen Klopp, if he's to be believed, and he says true to his word, you know he's talked about you know if we're entering the final stages of any match now, we're at the stage where we really need to go out and get three points. One point isn't really enough for us. So they've got that little bit of an incentive in that, you know, that added push to keep going until that 90 plus minute. You know, and and therefore I do like those Liverpool assets. Uh, the only slight worry would be is it the Yota or, or Firmino. Uh, I think Mane and, and Salah will be locked in. Mane, again, will feel that he's got something to prove. He's, he's recently been out in, in the media and reports that, that he feels this is his worst season of his professional career. Um, he cannot really sort of pinpoint specifics as to why that may be the case. But again, he's going to be feeling that he's got a point to prove and, and prove some of those doubters. Kevin, Kevin is Kevin. You know, he's tremendous, but City or City, and Pep will do what Pep will do. Uh, De Bruyne missed out last weekend due to what the Manchester City website stroke Guardiola said. You know, he just wasn't fit, he wasn't ready. Suggest there was a little bit muscle fatigue in there, but you know, ultimately, you know, if it had been the Champions League final or if it had been a United or, you know, Kevin would have started. I think, you know, we can more or less sort of agree on that. Um, and depending on how Guardiola wants to manage his squad between now and that Champions League final, knowing that they've won the Premier League, you know, that just again, there's too many question marks over De Bruyne and too many other options at, at better prices who are, are, are pretty much nailed down to start that I would, you know, like to go around him. Uh, you know, just again, touching upon what you said about Leeds and, and Rafina. I'm a Rafina owner. And uh, Bielsa talked about uh, things that we've mentioned a lot of times. A return to train is not a return to play. And that play is not a return to performance. And and he said that, you know, when players have been out for, for 10 days or more, you know, they've lost that little bit of sp- what I think, I think he referenced it as something like sport and edge, that little bit of sharpness, that little bit of fitness. And therefore, it takes a little bit longer for those players to get up to speed. That would imply the likes of maybe Calvin Phillips and, and Liam Cooper, who have just been, you know, missed the odd game, would be primed to return for, for Leeds this weekend. But there's question marks, you know, whether Rafina, who missed almost a month, whether Bielsa feels that he is ready to be thrown back into that starting eleven. Um, I hope so. You know, he came off the bench last week. Cameo got himself an assist. So I'd love to see him start, but again, just want to be aware of. So let's move it to the actual individual players then that we're kind of looking at. I do want to start off with Chris Wood. You said that he could potentially be a player of the season because he's just done such amazing stuff. And you look at his data as well. We were kind of sweet on him a few weeks ago when we thought that Burnley were basically a team with nothing to play for. And if somebody was going to score the goals, it was going to be him. Now, looking towards the end of the season, the fixtures are a little bit more tough. But with data like this, so over the last six game weeks, 5.31 XGI, 18 shots in the box, six goals, they're all the highest stats in the league. He's he's the best kind of in-form forward at the moment. So is this a situation where you think that form goes way over fixtures, especially with Burnley maybe playing with the handbrake off? Uh, yeah, look, I think if 
again, it depends on your own personal preference, what you're looking for, mini league, overall rank. Um, for me, I still have that mental block, as I do with Newcastle, Callum Wilson, maybe even Crystal Palace, Zaha, Burnley, Wood. I just don't see those teams scoring a lot of goals. And, and you know, when they do, you're going to need those players to, to score. Now, I know Chris Wood has been doing that and great, but, you know, can he continue that all the way through? Um, you know, if you want to stay with the pack and you want to stay in touch and you stay with the form, then, then Wood's your man. If you want to take a bit of a punt and, and go against that, there's a little bit of a risk. Like I say, I don't think he is an essential own, given those fixtures, given historically how Burnley perform, and given the fact that, um, you know, like I say, there's uh, you know, Sean Dyche with, with safety now in mind and, and a great season um, for, by their standards, you know, given the injury problems that they have. You know, and you've got Ashley Barnes there. You've got Jay Rodriguez. You've got Matai Vidra. Again, you know, Woods come off the last couple of games. You know, do we see maybe Sean Dyche planning more for next season as well? I know Chris Wood has picked up a couple of knocks. So it, it could be that he may look to protect him and think, you know what? You've done your job. You've had a great season. You, you know, we just don't know. So do I think he's essential? No. Um, so, Yeah. We go with that one. <laughs> I mean, the the thing is that Chris Wood is closest to, so he's about to break his most ever goal contributions in a Premier League season. He's matching 15 at the moment, but he's also two off the most goals that he's ever had in the Premier League. Do you think Sean Dyche might be aware of that and might push him towards getting that record? Um, I always say that there's no room for sentiment in football. Um, Look, Chris Wood was, is going to start, you know. I don't think there's any question with regards that what I was maybe talking upon and maybe it's what I didn't um, articulate very clearly was he could be protected maybe around that sort of 60 to 70 mark. And um, so it could well be, you know, that Chris Wood is afforded that time to, to get those goals. But again, I just don't see how Burnley have performed so well much better than expected. They're scoring goals. Um, you know, they blew Wolves away at Molyneux and they got a cracking result last weekend and two performances there that you wouldn't ordinarily associate with Burnley. So who knows, this might be, you know, this might be the new Sean Dyche. This might be the Sean Dyche that's, you know, alerting himself to other clubs and, and, and other, you know, um, boards that, you know, they can play a different brand and if they're willing to take a chance on him, then, you know, maybe he's the guy to, to bring silverware to another club. Uh, I still don't understand why Scott Parker's more linked than Sean Dyche to to Tottenham. You know, the, the man has kept Burnley up. He's worked on a shoestring budget, but that's a discussion for another day. The final player that I want to bring attention to is Christian Benteke. Now, we, we did actually talk about him last week. I'm still quite apprehensive of him, but he's still doing quite well. He's had a great run of form, most shots in the box in the last four game weeks, two goals. He's looking well part of that Palace plan. And kind of talking there about sentiment in football, he is one that maybe wants to tap into the reality that he's running out of a contract. Will he be at the club next season? And I think he's playing for that contract at the moment, maybe trying to make Palace aware that he's still got a little bit of something left. Do you think that that might be a reason to bring him in with some good underlying attacking data? Crystal Palace playing with a handbrake off another team, not much to play for. They'll probably concede a lot, but score a fair few goals as well. Yeah, I mean, we talked about Palace as an avoid during this run-in. And in fact, you know, we were talked about targeting opposing, play, um, you know, opposing opposition players and captaining those against Crystal Palace. So they, in terms of the results that they've put together, um, they've, again, they've probably exceeded expectations, and and that's been partly due to the fact that Ben Teke's form. I, you know, I'll go back to to what I just said about Burnley and Newcastle and and Palace. I just don't see those sides scoring a lot of goals. Um, uh, and when they do, you know that there's got a there's a heavy reliance on those players actually returning. And then I question, 
how long can that level of form continue with Ben Teke? Um, it's a it's, it's still a punt for me. Um, Palace are just a little bit too inconsistent. Uh, they just don't have that quality. I dare say on a, on a consistent level. Um, you know, Zaha has been very disappointing in in recent game weeks. I mean, Eze is is probably been again one of the what few shining lights along there with Ben Teket. Not an essential loan. If you've got him, great. I wouldn't say, you know, it's not a player that I'd be looking to take a hit for. If you've got a spare free transfer, then look, yeah, a Ben Teke or a Wood or anything like that, great. But other than that, uh, not for me, but I, I'm probably going against the grain and, and pissing in the wind there, <laughs> for, you know, for against a few because, uh, you know, I know a lot of people will be sweet and, and, and be looking to pick those two players this weekend and, and for the running. I like Wood, but I think Ben Teke's a stretch too far in terms of the puntiness. But the final point that I want to actually talk about is the reality is it has been for me for a while. I, I don't know if you'd consider it yourself, but for many, the, you, your season's already over by now for many people playing FPL. And so maybe the time is now to almost switch tact and experiment a little bit, go with some more fun choices, but also keep an eye on the teams that are playing really well towards the end of the season. The kind of case in point that I think of is West Ham. They had an excellent run towards the end of last season and they kept that going until I think injuries, maybe fatigue, maybe just a a lot of things combined for a perfect storm of negativity. Then I look at somebody maybe this season, Leeds, you know, they're, they're finishing the season really well and it, it kind of works out well, you know, the, the Liverpools, the Manchester Uniteds, Man Cities, they're going to be fine next season. They're, they're always there or thereabouts. But it's maybe finding those teams that are going to kick on, maybe push for a European place that you can invest in next season. And you can have a little bit of fun with that, maybe going for a rogue captain or a very differential pick. Just because the season's over and you can at least have a laugh with your friends or whoever's in your mini-league, if it, it is over, I mean, would you would you recommend that approach maybe for a fun end to the season, Ben, but also with bearing in mind that you're building towards next season, maybe identifying some really good targets? Uh, look, I think, isn't fantasy football and in game and being involved about having fun week in, week out from, from game week one? And that's how I've tried to play the game this season. There seems to be this obsession with overall rank and if you in a in a certain percentile, you are good, and anything below that, you're not worth listening to. And you know all of the fun seems to be getting drained out of the game. Um, I know there's a lot of hearty discussion in the community. Um, you know if you kind of do it in these final few days, when can you do it? And if you're not enjoying it and it doesn't put a smile on your face, then you have to question why you're even involved in a, in the game in the first place. I mean, like I say, I, I touched at the top. For me, it's 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 all just about the crack, really, the bit of banter. Look, if I can get one over on you, then absolutely excellent. If I can't, then fair play to you, fully deserved. We come back and we fight again next year. But does overall, I couldn't give a toss about overall rank. If it comes... Look, I play the game the way I want to play it. And if a decent overall rank comes of it, if I finish seven, eight millionth, uh, you know, the points I raise and the, you know, they still got the rationale and they still stand the test of time. You know, I don't even live by half of the the mantras or the, you know, the philosophies that I that I spout because that's, you know, we're catering for the masses in in essence. You know that. Uh, no, who wants to play the game like me with a, with a set and forget and 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 maybe hit take and no hit? Not many people. So, you know, take it with a pinch of salt. Enjoy it and see. Just have a bit of a laugh again. Let's bring the fun back into the community and uh, yeah, well, finish the season on a high. Yeah, I I think that's is good advice. Probably good for mental health as well. You know, we're, we're obviously in mental health week. And, you know, jokes aside, sometimes people do take this way too seriously and it does affect them. So I think it's a nice way to end the season. Just have fun. 
enjoy those really high scoring games I think that's going to be a good one to, to take part in towards the end of the season and we will have our leaders digest at the end of the season to kind of analyse how we will approach next season to improve but for now this is the end of our show I'm going to hand it over to Ben but just before I do I'd like to remind you to like share and subscribe because we've got so much good content on here through the week and tomorrow we do have the reddit Q&A session so in the comments below send in your questions anybody and anything can be asked I mean that that's very true for one of the Q&A sessions anything <laughs> was asked but yeah Good luck with your teams and we hope that you stay with us through this season and into the summer as well. Yeah, thanks Jason for that. Really enjoyed it. Another great podcast. Um, so that is um, attacking assets dropped. You know, if you haven't seen defensive assets, you know, check out those videos as well. In addition to the fantasy doc Monday data show, we've also got a bonus edition coming soon as well with regards to load management with maybe a particular focus on Manchester United in their triple game week. And of course, the content will be coming thick and fast from next week as we approach game week 37 and then in to the final weekend, game week 38 seems like an absolute lifetime this season. But it doesn't stop after that. You know, then we've got the the Euros just around the corner and loads of other exciting stuff. So please remember to follow, subscribe, keep your eyes and ears peeled for all this content that's going live. And we'll see you again very soon.